Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, put me after the smartest 12 year old kid in the world. <laughs> Make me look smart. Yeah. I'm 46, I didn't understand half of what she was saying. <laughs> All right, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Harith Iskander. Hey, Asha. <laughs> this is called Connecting with the Hot Chicks in the Audience. Uh, I'm a stand-up comedian. Uh, looking around, there's a lot of young people here, so I need to give a little bit of history. I've been doing stand-up comedy for 21 years, before some of you were born. So, uh, um, I'm, I'm born in Malaysia. I am Malaysian. Uh, my, my, my late parents, my late dad was Malay, and my late mom was English. Uh, she was from England, as most English people are from. And uh, so she came here in 1960, 61, 62. Imagine, imagine an English person landing in Malaysia in 1961. She, uh, she came and she stayed in Moa Johor. Moa Johor, 1961. Can you imagine? Probably not much difference from Moa Johor today. But <laughs> and uh, very quickly, uh, you know, she, she learned, she assimilated herself. And, and I asked my mom when, when, when I was bigger, I said, Mom, how, you, did you learn to speak Malay? You must have learned. My mom never learned to speak Malay. It's amazing. And yet she managed to live in Malaysia and communicate. It's very simple to all the foreigners here. Let me give you a quick piece of advice. She, uh, she told me this. When you're talking to a Malay person, all you have to do is repeat the last, uh, the last word they say. Just repeat it back to them. They think you're talking to them. <laughs> yeah? Malay people come up to you like, Hey, are you hujan? Ah, hujan, hujan. Oh, petang tadi panas. Oh, panas, 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 panas. <laughs> and it's not say the last word. You've got to repeat the last word. Don't just say. Because Malaysians will repeat everything we say. So if it's panas, go panas, 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 panas. No, because Malaysians were on the phone going, hello, hello. Yeah, 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 function. No, that, that, talk, that, talk, that, talk, that, talk. I'm at a that, talk, that, talk, that, talk. Terex, 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 terex. Tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us. Tell us college, tell us college, tell us college. Tell us college. Okay, okay, I'll call you back, I'll call you back, I'll call you back, I'll call you back, I'll call you back. I'll call you back, I'll call you back. Malaysians, we can't say I'll call you back. We gotta go, I'll call you back, I'll call you back, I'll call you back, I'll call you back. I'll call you back. <laughs> anyway, so that's what I do. I'm a stand-up comedian. What I've just witnessed is a little bit of stand-up comedy. Now, the topic of the day. Make them let passion become determine your profession. <laughs> yeah, most of you are sitting there going, yeah, nice topic. <laughs> Not going to happen. Uh, well, I'm actually a living example of that happening, because uh, let me give you a, a quick rundown. Uh, growing up, I uh, um, had you know, Asian parenting and, 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 and Masali parents, so I, was, I grew up in a sort of dual household with a little bit of the balance of the both. Difference between Asian parenting and uh, uh, of Masali parenting, and I'll use the word Masali here. Uh, Masali parenting, European parenting, uh, is, is e explanatory. They explain, you know, don't, Timmy, don't, don't climb that table. You'll hurt yourself. Timmy, if you climb that table, you will, you will fall, you will hurt yourself. Don't climb. Explain. Asian parenting, you want to climb? Climb la. <laughs> climb. You fall, you, you die. You die, you think I care. You think I care. <laughs> die la. You know how expensive you are? Die. I, I'd rather you die. Masale parenting, you know, you come back with your, with your exam results. Like, oh, 68, what's out of, a, out of a possible hundred? 68 of a possible hundred. Hmm. Only one question they want to know, did you do your best? Did, did, you, do your, did you try your best? <coughs> you yes, mommy, I tried my best. As long as you did your best. <laughs> Asian parenting, hmm. 98 out of 100. What happened to the other two? <laughs> Well, you eat, uh, you eat, is it? <laughs> ah, Hong, uh, his neighbor, my, his son, 104. <laughs> Possible, honey, go 104. Why you cannot get? So I grew up in that household. I grew up in a household uh, where, uh, you know, I tell you what happened. When I finished SPM, Form 5, when I finished SPM, my parents had already secretly, secretly enrolled me in, in, in further education. In this case, it was in Perth, Western Australia. So I just finished, I was 17 years old, just finished SPM. Yo, I'm going to hang out, man. I'm going to be lepa. I'm going to be all Malayu and stuff. I'm going to chill. <laughs> and my parents were like, no, you're, you're, going to, you're going to Australia. You're going to do your, your degree. And I'm like, what? I don't want to go. Oh, my God. I don't want to go. 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 I don't
go in Australia, Australia. What, what do I know about Australia? And anyway, uh, my parents had you know, worked it out. They, they sent me over there and I, I was flown over and I, and I got my degree and everything. But uh, now here's the thing, what I got my degree in, I got my degree in uh, communications and cultural studies. Very un-Malaysian, because uh, one thing good about my parents was they, they said to me, you can choose what you want to do. I don't want to go. No, you can't choose that. <laughs> so they, they sent me to the university. Anyway, I, I got my degree in communications and cultural studies, basically did a little bit of literature, a little bit of theater, a little bit of film and TV journalism, and I came back and I worked in an advertising agency. Now, to tell you the truth, even at that age, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, I still don't know what I was passionate about. Just, okay, get, get, must get degree. Because in Malaysia, you must get degree. Degree, very important, very good. Get degree, yeah, you know, you must, must have degree. <laughs> must have degree. That, I was told this from a very young age. You know, first of all, SRP, Form 3. Yeah, in those days, it was called SRP. What's it called now? PMR. PMR. Those, you know, my parents were like, you must, you must get SRP. SRP, most important thing in the world. You don't get SRP, you become a rubbish collector. That's a great, that's a great threat, isn't it? Become a rubbish collector. So I got my SRP. I said, Mom, I got my SRP. She said, eh? SRP, nothing. SPM. <laughs> SPM, you become a rubbish collector. Got my SPM, nothing. You must get degree. Got my degree. I got my degree. Came back in 1989. Got my degree. Went to my first job interview. I've got my degree. I went to Curtin University, Western Australia. Got my degree. You know what the guy said to me? Oh, that's very nice, but what job experience do you have? <laughs> degree, not so good. I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> but anyway, I got my degree and I worked in an advertising agency. Now, I worked in an advertising agency, Leo Burnett Advertising Agency, for three and a half years. Good job. I was an AV producer, audiovisual audio producer. Couldn't do commercials. I was doing radio commercials, TV commercials. And I was well on my way to an established profession. I was well on my way. Now, here's what happened at the age of 26 or 27. Don't worry, you got a lot of time. It suddenly hit me after two and a half years in the advertising agency. I'm not doing what I love. For the first time, I think I was about 26 or 27, I suddenly worked out, I'm not doing what I love. I didn't know what I loved before, but I suddenly realized, because uh, to answer your earlier question, how do you know what your passion is? I, I, I don't, I wasn't doing what I love. What did I want love to do? I wanted to make films. I wanted to make films, and, and I wanted to be an Oscar winner. I wanted to make films. And here I was making McDonald's commercials. I was doing McDonald's commercials. By the way, have you ever seen a McDonald's commercial? You know, you know that great end shot, that shot at the end where, where you've got the little cheese coming out and the little lettuce and the mayonnaise is... Mm. Have you ever been to McDonald's, looked at the picture and go, wow, that's amazing, that's a beautiful McChicken. Actually, look at the McChicken, like, that's not the same McChicken. <laughs> Do you know why? Do you know why? Because I'm responsible for those pictures. It, those pictures that are up on the, on the billboard at McDonald's, they, one burger takes about a good eight to 10 hours to set up and shoot. You get 200 patties, 200 buns, and you, no good throw, no good, no. you get the perfect bun, the perf deep, top bun, different from bottom bun, different. Spend and, and you get 200 patties, and you cook 200 patties, and then, then you throw away 199 of them until you get the one perfect patty. Then the tomato, ju tomato sauce, you know there's two blobs of tomato sauce. The, the tomato sauce is not on the inside, it's in a syringe. You syringe the tomato sauce, pop, so there's one plop here and one plop here. Same with the mayonnaise. I'm serious, it takes eight hours. That's why it looks so good. I was doing, that's what I was doing for my life. That's what I was doing every day in my life, lying to people in advertising. And I thought, what I, want to, I want to become a filmmaker. I want to, I want to make films. I want, but I'm earning, I was earning, earning 3,000 plus already by that time. If I left, I would, I'd, I'd left, I'd go back, start at zero. One I, can't, wait, I can't start at zero. I can't go back to zero. Here's where my actual talk starts. How many minutes? I'm oh, gone already. Anyway. Here's what actually happened, ladies and gentlemen, and this is why I, 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 I believe in this, this topic today. I went to watch a movie, uh, and uh, they, play, they were playing it really late, uh, it was like one-off movie, uh, 11 p.m., and it was at the Central Market, they used to have a cinema there, and the movie was a movie called Dead Poet Society. Familiar with it? Yeah. Robin Williams is a teacher, teaching his students, carpe diem, seize the day, you're going to be, you know, worms one day, do what you love, love what you do, be passionate about it. Just a movie, just a movie. I walked out of that cinema. The next day, I handed in my resignation letter uh, to Leo Burnett, and I, and I said, I'm leaving. Got 30 days, I'm gonna leave. Now, here's the thing. I was handed resignation letter, didn't know what I was gonna do, had no idea what I was gonna do, but decided, I'm gonna start back at zero because I've got to seize the day, I've got to do what I love, and I've decided I love films, I wanna make films. 
up to that point, for the last two and a half years, I'd been wanting to leave, but scared to, to start back at zero. A lot of opportunities had come up, and I was like, no, I can't go, I can't, no, that's not quite good enough, no. So I was waiting for something better to come up. When I handed in my resignation letter, boom, within a couple of weeks, a woman called me up, a producer, a lady who I'd met earlier on, her name was Linda Chong, and she said to me, Harith, I'm gonna be shooting this uh, TV series, and I met you, you're a funny guy, you know, come and write the scripts for me, you know, and, uh, and uh, do you wanna do that? And I said, yes, I am free to do that, because I'll be, f I'll be free in two weeks, I'll be there, and I started doing it. When I left, I started doing it. That program uh, went on to become a program called Jangan Katawa, which is uh, some of the older people, if you go to YouTube, you might still find it on there. Uh, Jangan Katawa became a TV series which in 1991-92 was the highest rated uh, TV series in Malaysia, viewership of 6.2 million, which is almost one third of the country. From Jangan Katawa is where it all started. Uh, at, first I w at first I was just a scriptwriter, then I ended up directing and I ended up being in the cast because I was writing all the scripts. Then I was directing the actors and then eventually the producer was like, look, you're doing it better than they're doing it. So why don't you, you, you know, you're, you're a bit of a comedian yourself. So I started being in, in front of the cast. Now from there, how, how did it get from there? So I was making TV, I was, like, yeah. I was like, oh, doing great, doing great, doing great. How did I get to become a stand-up comedian? Which was never, never, never on the, the horizon. Here's what happened. A friend of mine who had watched Jang and Katawa, who had known me from many years back, suddenly said to me, hey, Harith, hey, turns out you're a funny guy, which I always knew, she said. I always knew this because uh, in school apparently I was a funny guy. And she said, hey, I'm the PR of a, a hotel, the Subang Airport Hotel, back in the old days, the old Subang Airport had a hotel. She said, Made Kaday, we're having a little party. Uh, why didn't you come up and tell your funny stories? I said, what funny stories? You've got funny stories. And she told me all the funny stories I used to tell her. Eventually I said, okay. So I cobbled together, I wrote down some notes, got my funny stories together. I got on stage, did 12 minutes of funny stories. There were approximately six people there that night. <laughs> Four of them were waiters. Anyway, thought of, done it, didn't think about it. Next thing you know, I, I went to another club. Uh, this is a club called All That Jazz in SS2. It was a jazz club. There was a, there was a person playing music there called Rafik Rashid. He used to play guitar, change the lyrics to songs. I was watching him. During his break, someone said to him, hey, this kid does funny stories. Hey, so, hey, kid, come up here, do your funny stories. Did my funny stories. Someone saw me at that show and said, hey, I've got a function. An event, oh, no, do, 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 do the function. Yeah, I'll do that function. Someone saw me at that function. And for two and a half years, this went on while I was doing my TV and films. And I never, never took it seriously, never thought, I never thought I'm passionate about it. Until one day, some, a friend of mine said to me, hey, Harith, how much are you charging for your shows? Now, at that time, ladies and gentlemen, I was charging 500 ringgit for a show. Now, check this out. In Leo Brinnett, I was earning, what, $3,000 a month. Uh, my stand-up comedy shows were half an hour, so I was charging 500 ringgit. In those days, this was back in 1991, 92, 93, 94, 95, I was getting two, three shows a week, corporate shows. And I worked out till about, <laughs> that's why my, my school sucks. How much is that? <laughs> but, 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 well, let's, let's say five or $6,000 a month, yeah? So I, I was earning more playing around on stage and, even then I was working in, in Leo Burnett and still not taking it seriously until my friend said to me, you're charging how much? I said 500 a show. He said, do you know that the agent is charging the client 3,000 for you? Taking home two five, you're taking home 500. I was like, <laughs> People are paying what for me? Are you kidding me? And he said, serious. The next day my price went up to 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> now here's my point. Now here's my point. I went from 3,000 a month to 3,000 half an hour. And for many, many, many years, I actually put myself down thinking, I'm not worth this. This is crazy money. This is intense. This is insane money. And I went for many years, and I never, I can tell you this, I never called myself a stand-up comedian. I always called myself film director, film TV director, actor, writer. I never called myself a stand-up comedian because it was embarrassing that I was earning this much and I was becoming passionate about it. I started watching VHS videotapes. This is before internet, ladies, guys, and girls. Before the internet, we had to have VHS videotapes brought to us by friends who traveled to places like London in America and come in. We had to watch you know, Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy on VHS videotapes. No, no one used stand up comedy existed in Malaysia practically. And so I, I was earn, earning th all this money, and I still not calling myself a stand-up comedian because I thought that that's way too much. That's, I, 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 it's because 
what is stand-up comedy? It's, it's, it's nothing. It's just someone standing up on stage telling funny stories. And uh, something switched in, about, only about six, six, seven years ago, something switched. Um, I was going to my friend's house um, for Hari Raya, got out of the car, started heading to his house, and someone stopped me. Someone stopped me. Say, hey, Harith, uh, hi. Go, oh, I'm a big fan. Everybody's, everybody's, I'm, a, I'm your number one fan. Everybody says that. Yeah. <laughs> I like to get them. I go, oh, really? What films have I done? <laughs> no, I, I don't. I don't do that. I don't do that. Come on. He goes. He goes. I'm the I'm biggest fan, and, and, and oh, you're, you're so good. What you doing? I love what you're doing. And you know, I, I talked to all my friends about it. And during lunchtime, we all. Did, and this man stood there, and I tell you, it got a little bit embarrassing because he stood there for about eight to nine, ten minutes praising me. And uh, after a while, I said, well, you know, Mal the Malaysians, we can't take praise. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, 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 nothing like simple. Like, nothing like. <laughs> In the Malaysians, we can't handle praise. And he was going on and on and on about how important what I do. He said, you are so important, you're gonna, you're gonna keep doing what you're doing. And I'm like, oh my God, how important? Please, please chill. <laughs> chill, <laughs> not that important. And then after about 10 minutes, eventually when he finished, I, I turned to him and said, oh, so what's your name? And he gave me his name. I said, what do you do? Turns out he's a pediatrician. Pediatrician? Pediatrics. He's a doctor of children, children. He looks after children and babies. And at that time, in this area, it was near Kampong Warisan and Ampang, there was this de dengue uh, thing going on. And he was telling me about all, all the kids that some had died on his operating table. Some, uh, some his, his lives had saved. He had saved lives of children. And then I was so embarrassed. Because the last 12 minutes, he'd been praising me. And you know, you're a I was just thinking, Mike, you're a, you're a doctor of kids, and you're saving kids' lives, and you're, and you're telling me I'm important? And I'm, and I'm telling you now, it hit me. It hit me because I suddenly realized, well, he's someone who faces death every day. He's got to cut himself off from it. He can't get emotionally involved in it. And, he, and what he looked forward to was that half an hour, once a month or one, once every two months, to come and watch my show or some other comedy show and just laugh and go to work the next day and, you know, in between death and life and death and life, talk to his friends and have them laugh about, oh, did you hear what Harris said? Ha, 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 ha. Then I realized at that moment, that's when I stopped calling myself a film TV director because I wasn't really a, much of a film TV director. And I started calling myself a stand-up comedian. And that's when I suddenly realized, I, I worked backwards. I worked backwards to that one moment when I watched Dead Poets Society. And I worked backwards to why I was where I was and where I am right now was because I had actually taken the steps to follow what I wanted to do Although, at the time, it seemed like I'm already doing well. What I want to do will take me back to zero, take me back to, to, to nothing. Now, I, there are a lot of people out there who follow what they want to do and, 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 and you know, do not make the kind of money I'm making. And I, and I bring up money here because predominantly Asian kids in the room. So, <laughs> but at never any time was, was money important to me uh, until I started to have my own family. But the, th the thing being, I realized that if I had not taken the steps I took just to follow what I believe is, is what I wanted to do, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I wouldn't be, as Michael Reyes said earlier, touching those people who I have touched, which I didn't know about until I met this particular one person. And then I'm realizing, well, okay, what I do has a little bit of value somewhere along the lines. Does that mean I'm, I'm over time for that much? Or I have that much time left? Okay. 48 minutes, great. No, that's not <laughs> I'm not wearing my specs. But, uh, uh, so basically, when I meet younger people now, and they, they ask, they say to me, hey, you know, I'm doing engineering, and, you know, but I, I want to do this, or I don't know what I want to do. You know what? Here's how I put it. Uh, by the way, let me put it this way. When I was uh, three years in the advertising agency, uh, I actually, I actually worked my butt off. I worked my butt off. It was not what I was enjoying doing, but I enjoyed working my butt off. And by that I mean it was you know, 18 hours a day, 24 hours a day. On shoots we'd go 36 hours nonstop. I, whatever you're doing now, I would say find the passion what you're doing now. So do what you love, love what you do. So whatever you're doing now, Love that. Find a way to love that. And I, I can almost, I can't guarantee it, but I, I will say to you that if you, if you 
work your butt off and you find a way to love what you're doing, you're in fact practicing or, or exercising love, work, passion. And in exercising that muscle, I can almost guarantee that you will, something else will, will, will come up that you suddenly say, you know what, I love, I, I, I love doing that. And it will give you the strength because you know you're already hardworking and you can do it. It'll give you the strength to, to say, I can, I can go into that way, although this, this earns more money or this is important to my parents or, or whatever. So in, in that sense, uh, I'm just showing myself as an example of someone who's gone in one direction, changed the direction, didn't realize how important the direction cha directional change was until I met that one doctor. And now I, I throw myself 100% into what I'm doing. And uh, I'm happy that it's brought me to this point because who knows, you know, there's one person out there who will get touched enough to do what you love and currently love what you do. So thank you very much. I'm Harith Iskandar. Thank you.